Just keep knocking And we shall find So keep on keeping on Till the walls come down Raising higher till your feet Don't touch the ground Hear the power of praise Flowing out your mouth Let me hear If you leave freedom to the sky, hope is waiting on the other side. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, Don't stop and walk in, for you were made to fly. So keep on.
Sorry, I got to get myself all set up here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you're doing well. This morning in, in my little devotional time, I was reading a devotional and it was talking about how Eve was deceived by the enemy, by Satan, saying that you can have all the things, you can be like God. And I'm thinking about all the things that are going on in the world and all the deception that's going on in the world. It's basically the same thing. See, our eyes need to be focused on Him, on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our eyes and our lives must follow that, follow what we learn every single time we, we're here in church by the Word of God, the truth. The truth will set you free. So this morning, as we gather, instead of worrying about all the things going on around us, whether you agree or disagree, it doesn't really matter. The thing that matters is your relationship with Jesus Christ, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not what anybody else says, not what anybody else does, but you and Him. He died on the cross for each one of us so that we can have that choice. And that's an unbelievable choice. And it's an unbelievable thing that he did. His love that he shows us each and every day, no matter what we're going through, he's always there. That's what we can count on. So let's pray. Father God, we just worship you today. We're so grateful, Lord God, to be here in this place of worship, Lord God, with our brothers and sisters, to come together and to worship you no one else but you. Father, we give you praise and glory. And I ask you, Lord God, to bless everyone here, their families. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. 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 So thankful that Jesus took on flesh. He took on flesh and blood to be partakers of the things we go through so that he could take our sin to the cross. It's just so wonderful. That is love. So amazing. Amen. That we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing.
Himself. Hallelujah. And God exalted him. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. He had to go through the things he went through. And I asked him the other day, I said, How did you do that? How could you go through all those things you went through for us? One word answer love. One word answer. Yes, thank you. Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' name.
the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Come on, church! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God be praised! He's risen from the grave. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. When the love poured out over me, how my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise and honor. Now sing that chorus one last time. Rugged cross. And honor run to thee. Praise and honor run to thee. Praise and honor run to thee. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. From heaven's throne, clothed in human form, you showed the world the Father's love. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away for me. Your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. You gave, you gave your life away for me. For me. You lived a sinless life. A sinless life, yet you were crucified. You bought our freedom on the cross. Forsaken for our sin, you died and rose again. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God. You gave, you gave. has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. You gave, you gave your life away for me, for me. How glorious, how glorious is your love if I could sing forever. Cause you 
gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away for me. Your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. You gave, you gave your life away. Sing that one last time. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away. You gave, you gave your life away for oh, your grace, Lord. Your grace has broken every chain. My sins are gone, my debt's been paid. You gave, you gave your life away for oh, me. Forsaken for our sin, you died and rose again. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God. Amen. Glory to the Lamb. Praises to the Lamb of God. Maybe seated in his presence. Amen. Hallelujah. Time for us to get ready for communion so you can remove your mask. Um, we're just going to ask you to, we're going to try to abide by all the, the rules. And I understand the, uh, it's an inconvenience. I know this to wear us for worshiping. I just want to do whatever we can to just protect everyone. I'm not here to argue with you or not. I don't want any arguments going on whether you want to take a vaccine, not take the vaccine. This is a real thing. People are dying. We lost a brother-in-law. I lost two friends just the other day. A man that used to be the custodian in this church when we first came died of COVID. So it's a real thing. So we want to just be as cautious as we can and abide by whatever rules we can up to, up to that point that I mentioned last week. And so as we receive this communion, let's just use a theme that we're going to pray that God is going to bring an end to this craziness and this virus that's, that is, every time you turn around, there's another strain, there's another variance, there's another this, there's another that. And I know that my God is bigger than all that. Yes. And just as, just as it came, it could, it could leave and be eradicated from our society, from the world. It's literally shutting down parts of the world again. And it, we know that we're, our God is a bigger God. So as we use a theme for our communion, let's, let's use it for that, for God to intervene in our world and take this virus and send it right back to hell where it came from. Amen. 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 And not only that, I know that this communion can bring healing to you. It, the scriptures teach us this, that healing is the children's bread, and this is the bread that we take to heal. And I want you to believe that today, that as we take the bread and take the cup, that whatever it is that you're going through, whatever kind of a stress you're going, we're going to talk about stress today. How many know what stress is? Okay, the rest of you, you can go home now because if you don't want to know about stress, then 
But it's a real thing, and we're going through this time, and, and, and it's always around the holidays, isn't it, that the stress is, it even comes greater. So I want you to take your communion right now. And that's what we're going to believe God for. Help us, God. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. By the stripes that fell on his back, my body is healed. From the crown of my head to the very soles of my feet, every cell, every organ, every function of my body, and my mind, my everything is restored and renewed in Jesus' name. I believe it, and I receive it. At that, the Messiah took the matzah, and he broke it. He gave thanks to the Lord, and Jesus said, Baruch ato Adonai Eloheinu melechahulam hamotzis lekom in hachoretz. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. It was then that the Messiah added these words, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together, meditating on the broken body of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Jesus' name, let us partake together. Thank you, my God. Bring healing, God, to those that need healing today in their body, in their mind, in their spirit. God, in Jesus' name, it's the children's bread. Deliver, God, those that are bound. Whatever, God, as we ministered this week to those that were bound with different, just different things. Thank you, Father, for your precious blood and body. Then he took the cup. Lord Jesus, thank you for the, your precious blood, your sin-free, disease-free, poverty-free life is in your blood. And you shed your blood that has removed every sin from my life. Through your blood, I am forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future, and made completely righteous. Today, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and provision. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me the way you do. In Jesus' name. For I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Isaiah says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, but it's our own righteousness that falls short. And though the Lord searched, he could find no one to intercede. So his own arm worked salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. Jesus the Messiah lifted up the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Just as the blood of the Lamb brought salvation in Egypt, so Messiah's atoning death can bring salvation to all who believe. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Let us gratefully drink in the name of our Lord. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, for the precious blood that you shed, that we may be healed. We receive, God, our healing today, body, mind, spirit. Make us whole. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said amen. Amen, amen and amen. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Jesus. I have a few announcements that I have to make today. Um, Kathy gave me one that the Variety Show practice will be on Monday the 12th and Thursday the 16th, two days, from 6 to 8 p.m. And she said, please show up. <laughs> please show up. Yeah, on, the, on Monday the 12th, Thursday the 16th, 6 o'clock. And then the ladies' Christmas party tomorrow at 6 p.m. Don't forget, ugly sweater. It's an ugly sweater day. Or dress like an ornament. See, now, the men are more dignified. In our, we're, not, we're not putting on ugly sweaters or we're not ornaments. 
Although we sometimes we feel like we're ornaments. But we're not. We're going to have a time at the coffee house for our men's meeting. And you're welcome to come. We're going to have a catered, oh my Lord, what a beautiful meal we're going to have from Pastor Santo's son, who is a chef. And we're going to have some incredible food and for the ladies downstairs and for the men across the way. So you're invited to come. It, we're asking for a $10 donation to help towards the food. If you don't have it, and you, we want you to come anyway. Mike said he'll pay for the rest of it. So, <laughs> and that's and thank you, Michael. Yes. No, we'll take care of it. Don't worry. We want you to come and have a good time. And then, I want to announce that there will be no, there is no more adult Sunday school for the rest of the year. We're taking a little break from the adult Sunday school at nine o'clock. It'll resume in January when we read our ministries. Okay. Um, also, in our Operation Blessing offering that we take, the dollar offering, I'm going to ask you this year if we can do something a little different. Um, we didn't have the bags over here in the, in the, that we were helping with the uh, outreach in Niagara Falls, but we're going to do something different this year. We, we know of three families that are really in need uh, for a time of, of Christmas. Uh, they have children. Uh, some of them lost their jobs due to COVID, and they're struggling. Some of them have had surgery, and they can't work. So between now and, let's say, next week, uh, if you would like to take a, one of the a green envelopes that are near you, if you wanted to put a little something extra in the envelope, if, if you wanted for your tax uh, deduction, you're welcome to do that. Or just between this week and next week, um, we want to we want to try to help. Um, uh, there's three families that we want to do. So as you come today, if you can put a dollar in, fine. If you can put a little more in, that's fine. If you want to wait till next week, that's fine too. And then we're going to just bless uh, three families and help out with their uh, their Christmas. Is that okay? So if you have a dollar, why don't you run down here and and then we'll just re- get right to our message. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Though the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, the faith arise. When I cannot feel your hand in mine, the faith arise to you, God of mercy and love. I just, I made one mistake. I, I said that it was Monday the 12th, but it's not Monday for the rehearsal. It's Sunday the 12th from 6 to 8. That's Sunday the 12th from 6 to 8. What? No? It should be right after the service? So you want Sunday the 12th right after our service for a rehearsal, for the variety show, Christmas show. This Christmas, this year. <laughs> All right. Anyone else want to make an announcement? I have one more announcement to make. Today's a special day for a special man, special friend, confidant, colleague, close friend for over, in this ministry for over 30 years. Happy birthday, Pastor Tony! Yes, amen. 
Amen. Amen. Not getting older, I'm getting closer. We are in a, we're calling it like a mini-series um, of Christmas. And we're calling it the colors of Christmas. And I know it's the second week of Advent. We don't celebrate Advent like one of the liturgical churches denominations do. But I know what Advent means. And Advent is generally m meaning of a, um, a preparation for Christmas as Lenten season is a preparation for Easter. And so we as a non-denominational church, we, we celebrate and we prepare for Christmas. And we prepare for Easter too. And we're, we're, we're calling this uh, Colors of Christmas. And last, last week we started with the color green, the green Christmas. And this week we have a different color and it is the blue Christmas without you. So blue, just thinking. Now, I could have sung those, uh, those lines myself, but my skin-tight white outfit was still at Colvin Cleaner, so I couldn't put it on. And besides, I didn't want to scare everybody half to death. But think about it. I'll have a blue Christmas without you. Elvis Presley sums up the way some feel who find themselves going through some type of struggle, even in the month of December. Usually, when we think of Christmas time, we have happier thoughts. They're positive, they're exciting. But some years, your own personal circumstances change, can change the way you view things. Maybe that's how you feel as you enter this Christmas season, like, some life circumstance has altered the way you celebrate the birth of Christ, the Christ child even, and your view th this December. And while the background music in stores or in elevators, if they still have elevator music, might be saying, have a holly jolly Christmas, in your mind, it's impossible. But if we were to travel in time back to the days preceding that first Christmas, we'll find that there wasn't a lot of red and green because many were blue. They were down. They were depressed. They were fatigued. They were troubled. And if you're thinking that this is going to be a blue Christmas, you may be right, but I want to remind you of the words of the psalmist in Psalm chapter 30. He says this, Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Amen? And that's what I want you to remember. I want when we go through this whole message, stay with us through the whole thing. Because rejoicing is going to come in the morning. You remember this story. And I want you to turn in your Bibles and, and look with me again at Luke chapter 2, the first four verses in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that, was, that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So picture this. This newly married couple must have... They now had to leave their family, travel to Bethlehem, and oh yeah, Mary is nearly full term in her pregnancy. For them, this would be the first Christmas that was rather a blue one due to various reasons. And here's one of the reasons. There was what we're going to call relational stress. Relational stress. This was probably not the easiest way to start a marriage. What pressure Mary and Joseph must have felt. You probably, you probably have heard of those stress tests that you can take, that they give a numeric value to the, the, the level of the stress. 
uh, that's going on in your life, and, and newly married, moving, new home, new baby, these are ranked as one of the highest ones at the stress level. And the goal is to avoid too many high stress events in too short of a period of time. Well, Mary and Joseph were off the charts. This is all brand new for them, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you remember your first year of marriage and the challenges that came as you got to know each other? Anybody remember? your? You remember the challenges in your first year of marriage. Amen. Yeah. I heard that a young woman said to her mother, she said, Mom, is it true that in some parts of India, a woman doesn't know her husband until she marries him? The mom replied, honey, that happens in every country. <laughs> Isn't that true? Well, Mary and Joseph in, are in that awkward process of really seeing what each other is like. The courtship is over. This is the real deal now. They're married now. Spring training is over, and the season has begun. And to complicate matters, her unexpected pregnancy in that culture, no doubt, no doubt, caused them to be the talk of the town. Everywhere they went, they must have been surrounded by a whirlwind of whisperers. Think about why there was relational stress. Think about this. Their longtime friends didn't buy the story of the angel. Close family and friends questioned Mary's excuses, making ability. While others thought Joseph was making a mistake, the mistake of a lifetime, to be duped into such a conniving web from, from such a seemingly innocent girl on the surface. And so the first Christmas was looking pretty blue. As we approach Christmas time, you may have experienced some relational stress. Maybe you've had the stress of a broken friendship or a broken relationship. Maybe there's some, someone that you're not sending a card to or a gift to this year. Or at Christmas parties, there may be tension because you don't party hardy like you used to before you came to faith in Jesus Christ. For others, they would say that the bluest Christmases are those where a loved one has passed away or a marriage has been severed and there's going to be an empty seat at the table and a void when the gifts are being passed out. It may have happened a short time ago or a long time ago, but it comes back afresh because the setting just accentuates that that love, that loved one is no longer there. And when I think about that around the holidays, I think about our families, mine and Kathy's families and those that are in heaven. And I think about all the, the, the church family, the people in this church that have lost loved ones. And I, the reality of it is painful. Nothing causes more relational stress than the absence of a loved one due to a death or for some due to a divorce. I thank God for our grief share ministry. And if, you, if you're in that category and you lost a loved one, you really need to be with people that know what you're going through. And I want to encourage you to join in with the Grief Share Ministry. I'm so thankful that God has placed that in our church. There's another stress that Mary and Joseph faced, and that was physical stress. Physical stress. Joseph was born in Bethlehem. It was a little suburb of, of Jerusalem. But Joseph lived in Nazareth, which was 70 miles away. In Luke chapter 2, verse 5, it tells us that Joseph went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to, to him and was expecting a child. Now, we know that Joseph was a self-employed carpenter. There was no such thing as you know, personal days or you know, sick time or anything like that. And it, took, it was going to take over a week to walk to Bethlehem register with the government officials, and then walk back. He had to pack up enough food and enough clothing for the entire trip. Mary was at that uncomfortable, awkward stage of nine months of pregnancy. But there were no exceptions. Everyone had to return to their own home. And, you know, as, as a guy, it's difficult for me to imagine what kind of physical stress must have, it must have been for Mary. Every man knows that 
There, it's one thing to travel in tough times when you're traveling by yourself, but it's even more difficult if you're traveling with your wife who is about to have a baby. Amen? I mean, that's a lot of pit stops along the way. Amen? And I doubt that the donkey or whatever she was, or mode of transportation was very comfortable for her. And, you know, when we think about this, think about if it would happen today, it would be unthinkable. You, if you're nine months pregnant, let me tell you this. I know that you don't leave town. You stay near your doctor. You stay home. You stay near the hospital. And you stay near your mother. Amen? Amen. Now, here's what happens. As they get into town, Joseph stops at the first inn and returns. And he says to Mary, I got some bad news, honey. Looks like they don't have any vacancies. And Mary replies, oh, yeah, I got worse news. I'm having contractions. And, and he, she says, and I take it you didn't call ahead to get a reservation. What a way to begin your first year of marriage. Amen. Maybe you're facing some health issues or some painful struggles this December. And in the midst of your suffering, it's tough for you to remember that Jesus really is the reason for the season. Maybe you'll be traveling or, or maybe... Part of your stress comes from the fact that December has become more of a marathon than a time of peace on earth and goodwill towards men. The scheduling becomes exhausting. Whatever you're doing, ever, uh, addressing dozens of Christmas cards, fighting the traffic, uh, going to malls or whatever. And, and then there, there's the travel that you know that is coming up in a few weeks. You know the routine. You know you go to his parents and you go to her parents. And maybe there's an occasional step parent in there, you know, or maybe there's an event that you've got to go at your boss's house or whatever, and all the traveling and all the, all the craziness. And then you add shopping uh, to that already full plate and maybe some nighttime assembly projects that may relate to some degree of physical stress. And that's what, then you'll get an idea of what Mary and Joseph were battling, okay? There's another stress. Called the, we're going to call it emotional stress. There's a lot going on in the first year of our Lord. After the birth of Jesus, when they brought him to the temple to dedicate him, there's even more, a more emotional stress as Mary hears an unsettling prophecy from a godly man named Simeon. Look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. It says this, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. You see that last line? And a sword will pierce your own soul too. This is a foreshadowing of what is going to be, it's going to be like for her 30, about 33 years later when her son will be crucified. While we probably won't have some, someone making predictions about how our offspring will become the dividing line of humanity, we, f we do face stress, the stress of raising our children because we're living in an unstable world, aren't we? And that causes emotional stress. There's, there's unrest in our world that make for what we'll call a blue Christmas. There's still tension around the world where we still have military people in harm's way. And finally, there's another stress. We'll call it financial stress. Joseph and Mary didn't have much. We know that. That's why later, whenever they would offer a sacrifice at the temple, it was always a pigeon or a dove. And remember what's taking place here now. Caesar Augustus demanded a census for the very simple reason. These were all subjects. They were all under the Roman oppression when the decree was made to start counting heads. And you know why they were counting heads, obviously, so that they would maybe they'd make sure that they would collect taxes from, from everyone. But even though Mary and Joseph faced a lot of these stresses and adversities, there was an unexpected joy which got them through it. And the joy came in the form of this promised and prophesied baby, didn't it? But it also came through the confirmation of others. Well, see, she, they made it through the delivery, okay? 
Mary goes natural. Oh, my. I have no idea what that is. There was no, what do you call that, epa, epa something, whatever, to, to stop the pain or whatever, whatever that thing is that women get. Nothing like that, right? And Joseph must be like a fish out of water. He's a carpenter, and he's in the delivery room. But at the same time, the story starts to unfold to a group of bored shepherds who are keeping, the Bible says, watch over their flock at night. And here's what happens in Luke chapter 2, verse 9 and following. Listen to what it says. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Now, why would the angels say at the, the birth of this baby, this baby Jesus, turn sorrow into joy? What is so significant about this event that it, could, that it could bring about such a dramatic change? Well, let me answer that question by sharing with you what really is the main theme of this message. And I want to be really clear with this. It's okay to have a blue Christmas. At times, that, that's just the reality of life. Some of it is out of your control. But here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to believe. In the midst of our sorrow and adversity, Jesus can bring joy. You got that? In the midst of your sorrow and your adversity, Jesus Christ can bring joy. You may have relational, physical, emotional, and financial stresses. That doesn't matter. While it may be a blue Christmas due to some circumstances, it can point you to a bigger picture, one of hope and one of, of triumph. Amen? You see, the Christian story reveals how we can have joy. The Christmas story reveals how you can have joy in the midst of pain, in the midst of loneliness, in the midst of grief, in the midst or of frustration. You can still have joy. And we go to Matthew's gospel to find out how we can have this joy. Look at what with me in Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. They will call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Say that with me. God with us. God with us. Can you, imagine, can you begin to fathom the repercussions of such a statement? I mean, if, if that is true, the implications are endless, not just for Mary and Joseph or the shepherds, but for us. It means something for us. It means that God is interested in your life, and he's interested in my life. We're not some, uh, like some wind-up robots that go around and, and uh, apart from a caring, the caring eye of our creator. No, that's not at all. He went to some great length to remove the distance, to bridge the gap, to get close to us. And during those blue Christmas times, I want you to know he's still with us. God is still with you. You need to know that. I, I read an illustration that really blessed me. It's in, it's in his book called The Dance of Hope. The Dance of Hope. Bill Fry tells, tells us that a legally blind student named John, whom he tutored at the University of Colorado in 1951, one day Bill asked John how he became blind. The sightless student described an accident that had happened in his teenage years. The tragedy, that, that the tragedy took not only the boy's sight, but it also took his hope. He told Bill, I was bitter and angry with God for letting it happen. And I took my anger out on everyone around me. I felt that since I had no future, 
I wouldn't lift a finger on my own. Let others wait on me. And I shut myself in my bedroom door and refused to come out except for meals. The story surprised Bill because obviously a change had occurred. This student that he assisted displayed no bitterness, no anger, and John traced the change to a challenge from his father. The dad was tired of the pity party and ready for his son to get on with life. He reminded the boy of the impending winter and told him to put up the storm windows. Do the work before I get home or else, the dad insisted, slamming the door on his way out. John reacted with anger, murmuring and cursing all the way to the garage. He found the windows, the stepladder, and the tools, and he went to work. They'll be sorry when I fall off the ladder and break my neck. But he didn't fall. Little by little, he groped his way around the house, and he finished the chore. That, the assignment achieved the dad's goal. John reluctantly realized that he could still work and began to reconstruct his life. Years later, he learned something else about that day, not about himself, but about his father. When he shared this with Bill, he said, I later discovered that at no time during that day had my father ever been more than four or five feet from my side. The father had no intention of letting the boy fall. Your father has no intention of letting you fall either. What is painful today will produce character tomorrow. You can't see him, but he's present. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, you are shielded by God's power. Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us. We need to get that into our head. The Bible says that we have a high priest, Jesus, who, who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. So in those moments when you find yourself in the midst of a blue Christmas during the storms of life, rather than telling God how big your storm is, why not tell your storm how big your God is? Amen? Remember, God knows our pain. Our, the Holy Spirit, our wonderful counselor, promises never to leave us or forsake us, regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstances. The Bible says, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear anything. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You're with me. In other words, he cares about you. And God promises to take away your pain, and ultimately forever in heaven. Revelation chapter 21, one of my favorite verses, verse 4 says this, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So even if this December is a tough one for you, you can still be joyful in the midst of suffering if you believe the outcome is worth the pain and that there is a compassionate God who will be beside you when you're in that valley. Amen. Let me read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I love this verse also. Verse 16 through 18 says this, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that, out, that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. Now, it might take months for the hurt to heal or the grief to subside or the cancer to be eradicated. But the main thing to realize is that we have a God who is with us, even in those blue times. The Bible doesn't command us never to grieve. That's not fitting with the character of God at all. But I love the way the Apostle Paul explains it. He explains it to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, so we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Amen? The context of that verse is that Jesus is coming again and that he will make everything right. 
In other words, he's telling us, keep the big picture in mind. Keep the big picture in mind. You see, the grim reality is that when the doctor calls with the test results, sometimes it's not always good. That's just a grim result. And as much as I hate it, couples do get divorced. And in the workplace, pink slips are handed out even in December. And sometimes, you know what? You don't make the team. And we do live in a fallen world. And tragedies do happen. And you know, before I close this message, I was asking the Lord, how do, how do I do this? Because I had it in my heart to do this. And, and I just, I want to speak to those who are here today that may be facing a blue Christmas and, and receive the prayers of this congregation in this season. Maybe, maybe you lost a loved one in 2021, and, or maybe and this is your first Christmas without them, or maybe it's your fifth or sixth or tenth or whatever it is without them, and, and it hasn't gotten any easier. Or maybe you're alone for this holiday or away from family or your family's in disarray or you split up due to a divorce or perhaps you haven't had landed a job and you're feeling the pressure like you never felt before. And, and your Christmas could be blue for a number of reasons. But I would like to pray for you today. And if you fall into one of these categories and this message is meaning something to you that you're struggling with pain, I'm just going to ask you to do something you don't have to do it if you don't want to, but if you're feeling that struggle today, can you just lift up your hand and let me pray for you? Is there anyone here that is going through? I see those hands. God bless you. Thank you for your courage. You know what? If, if you see someone with a hand raised and you're near them, can you just raise your hand and agree with us? Can we agree in prayer for those that are going through might be a blue Christmas? Can, let, let's just pray together. Lord, for every person whose hand is raised in this room, and for those that may be listening on the internet, whatever, God, I hope that as, as I pray, they feel the loving hand of the Heavenly Father on their lives this December. I pray, God, that they will know that the Spirit of God wants to comfort everyone and provide a closeness to all of us who are listening to my voice right now. Father, in Jesus' name, remind them, Lord, of what your Word says, that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. Remind them, Lord, that you never waste a hurt and that the suffering that they're going through will produce a harvest of blessing. And if, if, they, if they don't get discouraged and if they don't give up, Lord, will you give them that peace that we talk about, that passes understanding. Give them your peace today, O oh God. Will you wrap your arms of love around them and help them and give them uh, the, uh, give their, ver give their, uh, their adversities over to you Give them to you, God, this Christmas season. And be close to them, I pray. And I pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everyone said amen. Thank you so much. I pray that you receive this prayer, even in the face of blue Christmases. The overarching truths of the Bible can sustain us. Jesus came to earth to save you. And God is with us. And that's what keeps us going in the midst of our pain. Amen. I want to share one story with you as I close. Maybe you heard about the father who walked past his son's room late one evening to find the door cracked open and his light still on. He peered in and saw his son reading a Wild West novel. And he knew the boy was supposed to be asleep, but the boy was giggling, saying, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. Well, the father was overcome with curiosity and he pushed the door open and he said, son, you're supposed to be asleep. What are you doing? Well, I'm reading this Wild West novel. He says, son, I couldn't help but hearing you say, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. The boy's face turned red with embarrassment that his father had overheard him. He said, dad, I was reading the book and every chapter, it seemed like the villain was beating the tar out of the cowboy and it was driving me crazy. So I skipped to the end of the book and I read the last chapter. Now I know what's going to happen. So I'm reading through the book now, and whenever the villain is getting the best of the cowboy, I just smile and say, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. You see, if you know the end of the story, then you aren't overly concerned with the development of the plot. Are you with me? I don't know about you, 
But I read the end of this book, and I know that in the end, the Christians win. So I don't have to be overly concerned about how it's going to work out. Not only do we win, but because Jesus came to earth to be with us, we can have joy. Amen? We, we can have joy. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Amen? How many remember what the, what the angel said to Joseph as he tried to explain Mary's pregnancy? Do you remember what he said in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21? He said this, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. There it is. There it is. Why did God send his son? Why did he send Jesus on that first Christmas? So that he could save his people from their sins. So that he could save us from our sins. So that he could save you from your sins. So that he could save me from my sins. If things are looking blue, why not turn your life over to the one who can change the picture? His name is Jesus. And he wants to be your Savior. And he wants to be your Lord. And if you've never done that, what a perfect time in this second week toward Advent of Christmas. Accept Jesus Christ into your heart. Let him change your life from the inside out. It doesn't have to be a blue Christmas. It may be due to circumstances, but Emmanuel, God is with you. I never want you to forget that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Thank you, Jesus. Father, as we receive the benediction that we pray each week, I pray, God, that it will take on a special meaning today because I know that there are those that are going through struggles with this virus, with all kinds of things that are happening in this world. We don't know what's happening from day to day sometimes. And so, God, I pray for the blessing to fall on your people, that we will be strong and be courageous in this, in this time, and that the Christian, that people will turn to the Christian for the answer, because we have the answer, and the answer is your Son, Jesus Christ, that's living in our hearts. Help us to be one that will give an answer to, one, to those that will ask us, as the Scripture says, to give a witness for those that are asking us the questions. And so we receive the blessing today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you hope. Hope because we have hope in our Lord Jesus Christ who, ro who rose from the grave. May he give you joy that's unspeakable and full of glory because he is with us. And he will give you peace, a peace that passes all understanding. And that peace will guard your heart. It will guard your mind against anything that the enemy would try to put into our hearts or into our minds, and we'll have the protection of the peace of the Holy Spirit of God because he rests in our lives. And we thank you, God, for that peace. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand to pray. Put your mask on and tell someone it was good to be in the house of the Lord as you leave. Sing a song of celebration, lift up a shout.